you would open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24, I want to encourage you to do that because uh, you're going to want to uh, look at this, some of this stuff and know exactly where it is. Uh, also, there's an outline provided in the bulletin. For the last three weeks, we've been uh, uh, looking at Jesus and his confrontation with the scribes and Pharisees there on the Temple Mount. And now we come to Matthew chapter 24 and 25, and we're only going to get to part of it today. We're going to spend about five weeks here. And uh, I know that there's some people that are relieved because this all talks about, you know, the end of the world and some stuff like that. And I had someone a, a, a few months ago say to me, I'm, I'm concerned that Jesus is going to come before you get there, and I'd like for you to clear it all up before he gets here. Uh, you really don't have to worry about that. But uh, Matthew chapter 24, we come to what is maybe one of the most mysterious, certainly the most controversial, maybe most important sections of the whole Bible, the New Testament. This teaching of Jesus that we find here, it's called the Olivet Discourse because it took place at the top of the Mount of Olives. And for many, many people, this is the passage that is the absolute proof that Jesus is who he said he was and that the New Testament Scripture is true and from God. Now, I say that, however, there's ambiguities throughout this. There's all kinds of questions. There's all kinds of confusion. And for some people, the ambiguities in the Olivet Discourse are a stumbling block. R.C. Sproul, one of my favorite commentators, said, this text is what cemented his faith in Christ and Scripture. But in his essay, Why I Am Not a Christian, the famous atheist Bertrand Russell said that the Olivet Discourse is why he rejected Jesus Christ and the Bible as God's Word. Well, this is important stuff, and what you understand about it and what you believe about it are important. We're going to be here for five weeks, so we're going to take a little bit of extra time today to lay down a background and to set the context, because this is very, very important. Why is this passage so confusing? Well, there's several reasons. First of all, we don't know everything Jesus said on this occasion. Just understand that. This is not an exhaustive thing. There was no tape recorder here, right? Matthew here gives us a summation of a private conversation that Jesus had with his 12 disciples, and that conversation might have lasted for hours. And you could read it in a few minutes here. This is a summary of it. So we don't know everything that was said. And if you take Mark's version of this and Luke's version of this and you stick it down side by side, you get a little more information. But even with all three of those accounts of this conversation, we still don't know everything that Jesus said on this subject all through his ministry and much less even on this one occasion. But friends, here's what we can trust. We can trust that we can know and that we have here everything that the Holy Spirit thought we needed to know. So we don't know everything. But we know everything that we need to know here. Secondly, this is what some people call apocalyptic literature, apocalyptic prophecy. There's not a lot of it in the New Testament, but there is some. The book of Revelation is apocalyptic. The book of Daniel, there's other places that are apocalyptic prophecy throughout Scripture. And apocalyptic prophecy is by design somewhat difficult to understand. It just is. It's designed that way. The Greek word apokalupto means the unveiling or the revealing of something. Something's hidden and, and you lift the curtain and you get to see it. But never ever is everything that God knows and everything that is hidden from us, never is everything unveiled for us. That's God's prerogative, right? We just get little pieces of what God wants us to know, and specifically, the things He showed us are things that He wants us to respond to. He shows us the things He wants us to do something about. But again, friends, uh, this, uh, we don't know everything, for, not for our curiosity, but for His purpose and His plan. Here in this passage, God unveils us some glimpses into the future. Now, a distinctive of apocalyptic prophecy. Every time you have it, whether it's in Daniel or Revelation, a distinctive of it is that not always, but quite often, it describes, it, it, it is given and it describes a near event, which is going to happen in just a little bit, right? And then that event itself becomes a reoccurring historical theme or is a foreshadowing of some kind of climactic event in the distant future. 
So sometimes something is fulfilled and then it's fulfilled again and again and again. Sometimes it's fulfilled in the near future and then it's going to be fulfilled in the end times way down the road. And here's the other thing you need to understand about apocalyptic prophecy. Sometimes that ultimate climactic fulfillment, it doesn't even take place here on earth. Sometimes that is from God's perspective and it takes place in the heavenlies. Both the Old and New Testament reveal to us that behind every earthly struggle between good and evil, between light and darkness, every time you and I get involved in spiritual warfare here on earth, there is a great spiritual battle also taking place in the unseen realm. And we're just one front of this battle. And, and sometimes we see this immediate fulfillment of prophecy here, and there's an ultimate prophecy, and it takes place over there. Also, the imagery of apocalyptic prophecy is often, it's more of a montage than a timeline. More of a montage than a timeline. Now, I want you to do something for me. Uh, raise your hand if you remember ever in your life spanning the globe with the wide world of sports. Raise your hand if you remember that. You are very old people, okay? <laughs> you raised your hand, you just confessed it, right? You guys are really old. You know, that old TV show, which for those of you that don't know what that means, it's the way a TV show started. The narrator would begin the show, and he would talk about the thrill of victory. And as he did, you'd have a montage of, of different sports clips. There'd be some high jumper jump over a bar, and some soccer player hit the winning goal, and maybe a guy sink in the winning putt in some big tournament. And then the narrator would say uh, uh, that we, we also are going to see the agony of defeat. And that was his phrase, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. And, and it was funny because with the agony of defeat, they always showed the same clip over and over. It's this ski jumper doing a horrible face plant and then sliding down the mountain. It's the same guy over and over. I looked at some of the clips, and, and through the years, they changed the thrill of victory. They never changed the agony of defeat. Same guy. But no one ever looked at that and said, which happened first, the high jumper or the ski jumper? You don't ask that question, right? Because it's a montage. It's a thematic montage to give you a feeling of what, of what the world of sports is about. It's not a timeline. The temptation that many people have when they look at Bible prophecy is to try to press it to get their timeline to get to, so that they can know what is next, and what's going to happen next. But guys, that's not why God gives us prophecy. That's not God's message. That's not his purpose. It's for you to know everything. In fact, Jesus says there's stuff you're not going to know. Stuff that I, he says, no man knows the day nor the hour when the Son of Man returns. Anybody that tells you they know it, you know that's a false teacher because they're contradicting Jesus. When God does reveal the future, he has a purpose for it. And the purpose is never just so we know something, just so that we're informed. Listen, invariably, all revelation is given to call God's people to some action. And when you read prophecy, don't just think about what's going to happen. Think about what am I supposed to do because of this. That's the point of it. And as we go through this today and for the next few weeks, don't focus on the timeline. If you do, you'll miss the montage. You'll miss the point of what's happening here. Finally, and not everyone agrees with me, but one of the reasons that this passage is uh, confusing, I, I believe this very strongly, is that the disciples themselves were a little confused. I think they got it cleared up later, but they asked some questions that reflect an ignorance. And if, if you don't understand that from our perspective that they didn't know what they were asking, you can't understand the Lord's answer. He knew. I mean, he didn't correct them. He just answered their question, but they asked a, a, a me messed up question. And that's why it's kind of confusing, especially for people that don't understand the context here. There's going to be three axioms of our study. Here's the three things that I'm just assuming, and this is going to govern us for today and the next four weeks, five, five weeks altogether. Number one, this text has been included by the Holy Spirit in Scripture because God wants to communicate something to us. There's, this is here for a reason. God has something He wants to say. Number two, there's going to be a lot of stuff that we, we can't understand, that we can't explain, that I can't clear up for you because no, nobody knows the answer. But what God wanted to communicate, that part I guarantee will be clear, right? If God wants us to know something. He's not going to hide it. He's going to make that part is clear. So the stuff that's clear, that's what we need to respond to. And, and I'm just going to say this, and we'll, we'll touch on it in a second, and we'll move on. 
it is very important anytime you do Bible study, but it's particularly important, it's vital here that we distinguish between those things that we can know and those things that we believe. Those are two different things. Now, frankly, there's a whole lot of people that have really, they have a real problem with this. Just watch the news. Go read social media. People, people have a horrible time today separating what is a fact from their own opinions and the, about the fact or the narratives that someone has created to put the facts together. It's a problem in our world today that people can't distinguish facts from theory. And it's true in the church world. You can do speculative theology based on some of the stuff that you're going to see here. And it's interesting, and it can be fun, and I think sometimes it can be helpful to us and encouraging to us to to try to theorize a little bit about what this means and how it fits with other scriptures. But friends, when it comes down to the bottom line, we need to focus on that which we know to be true from the scripture and not the things that we believe might be true about the Scripture. You need to separate those this week or you're just going to be really frustrated. We must never allow there to be a division uh, in the body of Christ over differences about things that frankly are just stuff we believe that cannot really be known from God's Word. This happens all the time. I had this view of this and you have that view of that and then we have two different churches. They won't talk to each other. And the truth is you're both giving your opinion about something. Let's agree on the things we can agree on, and let's recognize those other things are opinion. I guarantee you that's what God wants. We can know that. Well, as we begin to work through this text, I, I'm going to share some things that are opinion. I'm going to share some of my opinions. I will try. I, some, I struggle with this, too. I'll try to label those for you. I'll try to label what's my opinion, what's someone else's opinion. But what I want us to do is to really focus and emphasize on the things that we can know, the things we can be sure about. What are those things? Well, for the most part, we, we know what the Lord's words meant. And we can recreate a context and we can understand in the original hearers, we can understand how they would have heard it. Sometimes I, I can't prove that. I, I, it's an indicator because I wasn't there 2,000 years ago. But there's scholarship that we, we pretty much know what the words meant and how they were heard. You know what? We know a whole lot about what actually happened in history. We know a lot about history, things that did happen. And I'll tell you what we know more about. We know more about the stuff that hasn't happened yet. (laughs) I think this happened. I know this hasn't happened yet, right? And so those are things that that we know. So as we work our way through the text, let's look for things we know. Here's the most important things, the things that Jesus commanded. If Jesus says, I want you to think this way, I want you to feel this way, I want you to do this, that's important, and we know it, right? So let's look at those things. Okay, so here's, here's what happened. Jesus is having this confrontation with the Pharisees. He delivers to them seven or eight woes, right? He gives them the woes. And then Matthew 24, 1, the conversation's over. It says Jesus came out from the temple. He was going away with his disciples, and they came to point, and the disciples came to point out the temple buildings to him. In Mark and chapter in Luke, they tell the same version of the story, and they both said that not only did he just point out the temple stones to them, but they said, Teacher, behold what beautiful, wonderful stones. Not beautiful, wonderful stones. I will tell you, they were probably awestruck. It's possible that some of these backwoods Galilean fishermen, that this is the first time they've been the temple. It's not sure, but it's possible. But I guarantee you, this is one of the wonders of the ancient world. And these guys didn't have anything like this back on the lake. They had never seen anything like this before. And it was an amazing thing to them. You know, to build the temple, which was, it was one of the ancients. There was, there was a, a Persian writer. And you think about the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. There was a Persian writer that said, if you haven't seen Herod's temple, you haven't seen a fine building. Because this was, an, this was an amazing piece of architecture. Literally, they went to Mount Zion, which was the tallest mountain in this region, and they took the top of the mountain off. They just took the top of it off. This is ancient times. They created a 1,000-square-foot plateau of solid rock, and that became the foundation on which they, they built the temple. They built it of white marble, and then they put plated gold on it. And the temple itself, one writer said that the the gold of the temple shone so brightly in the sun that a man could scarcely bear to look at it. 
The temple cornerstones where they framed it up on the foundation that were just above the ground, they've actually excavated a couple of these. They were, and I want you to try to think about this. Imagine the, this, the, the size of this temple. These cornerstones were 40 feet by 12 by 12. Okay? That's a big slab of marble. 40 feet, 12 by 12. Estimated that it weighs maybe 100 tons. They quarried those as a single stone and transported them miles to the building site up the hill, up the top of Mount Zion to build the temple. Amazing thing. I was in the Holy Land a few years ago with some guys from my church in Indiana, and they were engineers. And they build things. They build big things. And uh, I, I, a couple of times I said, how do you think they, they did this? And they're both looking at me, and they're going, well, I know how I would do it. But they didn't have what I have. I have no idea how they did it. And this is a mystery still to modern engineers, how some of these things were done. Well, as the disciples were admiring this, this incredible edifice, which, by the way, they, their nation was proud of it, and, and it was dedicated to the glory of God, and they were proud of, of that. As they were admiring it, saying, look at this, look at this, amazing. Jesus said to them, do you not see these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. Hey, this is temporary. It's a shocking prediction. It's an unimaginable prediction. Well, Jesus walks down and around and out the city. He goes over the valley of Kidron. He goes up to the top of the Mount of Olives to this vista. This is, he's sitting up there looking back at the city. This is what it looks like today. Look similar back then. He's sitting at the top looking back over the city. And um, the disciples, verse 3, as he's sitting on the Mount of Olives, that's why they call it the Olivet Discourse, the disciples come to him privately. It's just the, just the 13 of them, right? And they're saying to him, tell us when these things, referring to the not one rock on the other rock, when these things will happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. Now, I'm just going to tell you, I, I believe the disciples were confused. The question indicates they're confused. They ask one question with three parts, and their assumption is that there's one answer, and when, when Jesus comes back and the end of the world and the temple's destroyed, it's all, they think it's all the same thing. Jesus, he, they're asked three, three questions. When will the temple be destroyed? What will be the sign of your coming? And that word, you know, you hear about the second coming. That word there is the word parousia. It literally means the appearing, and it, it brings to mind the appearance of a great king with his troops all in full regalia. It's only used one time in all Scripture, and it's right here. So we, we talk about the parousia all the time, but this is the only place it appears. And finally, what is the sign of the end of the age? or the consummation of all things, literally. It's, it's three questions, but they think it's one, and they ask one. Now, you have to understand their, where they're coming from, what their background. Here's what these guys have been taught all their life, because this is what first century Jews believe. They believe that human history and time was divided into two ages. There was the first age, which they called the present age, which they believe had been corrupted by sin and was irredeemably bad, and there was nothing good come out of this. And this is why all these bad things were happening, because we're in the present age. It's not good. But then there is the age to come. And the age to come, all the millennial, all the messianic prophecies will be fulfilled. Messiah will restore the Davidic throne. The Jews will again be the most beautiful, wonderful place in the world, and they're in Israel, and everything's going to be great. They believe that between the present and the age to come is the thing called the day of the Lord. And they didn't think of it as being a day, but it, it, the age of the Lord. And in this day, which they didn't know whether it was going to be 30 seconds or 30 years, they didn't know, but it was, it was in between the two epic periods, God was going to judge all sinners and at the end gather all the righteous to himself and start the new age. That's what they believed. Now, Jesus has just told his disciples, they, they, I am the Messiah, I have come to fulfill all the Scripture, but I'm going to leave for a while, and then I'm going to come back. So they've been taught this one thing all their life, and now Jesus has taught them this other stuff, and they're trying to reconcile all this, and they're confused. They're trying to put the timeline together. And he just told them this stuff about the temple. That's crazy. And so they ask this question. 
The problem is they had not seen what they would write about later, this thing called the mystery, the mystery of the church. They didn't see this. It's another thing they called this, this thing where God was going to bring Gentiles and Jews into one covenant community. They, did, they didn't see that coming. They saw it later. They wrote about it later. They didn't see it here in 33 A.D. Also, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus, when he was talking to them in, in, about this, in this discourse, he said when this thing happens to Jerusalem, the Jews, they will fall by the edge of the sword and they'll be led captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until, it's an interesting phrase, the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. It's an interesting phrase. What's the times of the Gentiles? Well, see, as part of God's judgment, the great and terrible day of the Lord, Jesus said, as part of that, the Gentiles are going to come, and one of the reasons you'll know they're in this time is because they're going to take control of Jerusalem, and they're going to control the Temple Mount. Trample underfoot means they're going to have dominion over it. You're not going to be able to go up there and do what you do. In 70 A.D., that happened. He's speaking in 33 A.D. In 70 A.D., it happened. Next month, I'm taking a group to the, uh, tour Israel, and the Israeli government is our host, and our tour guides are certified by them, and everything we do is approved by them, and my group will probably not get to go up and walk around the Temple Mount because they still don't have control of it. They lost control in 70 A.D. They haven't got it back. So evidently, we are still in the age of the Gentiles. And that's both good and bad. It's bad because it is still a sign of God's judgment upon the Jewish people for rejecting their Messiah. But you know what? It's good for us because in this age, us Gentiles, are, we, we were far from God. And now we are being brought near to him through Christ. In fact, we're being grafted into a spiritual version of his people, Israel. That's what the New Testament teaches. In Romans chapter 11, verse 25, Paul was writing to a Gentile, predominantly Gentile church in Rome. And uh, he said, look, I do not want you, you Gentile Christians, I don't want you to be uh, uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. A partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. There's this season where the Gentiles are being used by God, and, and then something's going to change. And right now, the, uh, there's a partial hardening in Israel. During this age, as Israel is being judged for rejecting her Messiah, many Gentiles are coming to faith, and that shows the grace of God. It also shows the Jews, I can make followers out of anybody, right? I don't need you. Verse 26, when this all ends, Paul said, all Israel shall be saved, just as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion, and he will remove ungodliness from Jacob. Now, that passage, uh, it's a controversial passage, too. It certainly does not mean that every single Jew in the world is going to come to Jesus, but the Bible does prophesy, and I frankly believe that we are seeing it right now, that many will. And that hadn't happened in history. Here's what's clear, Romans 9, 6. For they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendant. You see, God's looking at things differently than he used to. Today, what makes one a true descendant of Abraham is not having Abraham's blood, it's having Abraham's faith. And so we, if we have the faith of Abraham, can be the children of Abraham. Well, the disciples conflated these three issues. So Jesus, he gives an answer to them. It's one answer, but for the next two chapters, he's going to move back and forth between those three stations. And one of the reasons this is hard is because we're not exactly sure which answer is answering the question, when will the destruction occur? What are the signs of your return? And what is the signs of the end? And all three of those friends are connected. And I suppose if you're looking at them from eternity in heaven, it's like one event to that person who a day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is a day, but they're not at all the same. In fact, all those things are thousands of years apart from each other. But let's just walk through the text. And uh, I, I want to give you six facts, and I'm, I'm going I'm to run here, but there's some really important stuff here. 
I'm going to focus on the stuff we know. I'm going to give you a fact that we know and a response that we should, we should give to God from each of these. And then we'll make a few comments on some other stuff. Number one, there will be, there will be, whether you talk about the destruction of Jerusalem or the coming of Jesus or the end of time, there will be false messiahs, Christ, saviors. So don't you be deceived. Verse 4, Jesus answered and he said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. I am the Savior of the world. And they will mislead many. And friends, this has happened throughout history. From Simon the Magi, we see him in Acts, who ends up trying to buy the power of God, claim to be something that he wasn't, to Jim Jones, and, and everywhere in between. There have been many, many false saviors. And I'm telling you that right now, everywhere in your world, there are false saviors. There are people, there are preachers, there are politicians, there are psychologists, there are scientists, there are educators, and they're all given this message, I got the answers to life. Listen to me, listen to me. I can save you. I can save you. Put your trust in me. Follow me. But none of them are Jesus. And Jesus warned us about them. Number two, you can count on this. There will be many human and natural disasters, but fear not. If you're my follower, there's going to be all kinds of bad stuff happen, but fear not. Verse 6, Jesus said this. You know, and we don't know which he's talking about, what he's thinking about. They, they asked three questions. Look, you're going to be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will, over the course of history, nation's going to rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdoms. And in various places, there are going to be famines and earthquakes. But all of these things, all of these disasters, they are merely the beginning of birth pains. Friends, why should believers, Christians, fear wars and human disasters and natural disasters? Do we not believe that God is in control of our lives? Do you believe that? Why, why would you be afraid of things? Let me ask it this way. What's the very worst thing that could possibly happen to us? Well, maybe me or one of my loved ones would suffer and, and get the opportunity to glorify God in our hardship. Yeah, that would be horrible. Or maybe we would die, and then we get to go right to heaven. Right? That'd be horrible. You see, if for you... To live is Christ and to die is gain? If you were one truly seeking the kingdom first, why would you be afraid of having the opportunity to honor God in suffering or just going on to heaven and be with him? Hey, we don't need to fear those things. Here's the Lord's message. When all these things start happening, these things that cause men to tremble in fear, don't you panic and think, oh, it's the end of the world. Don't think that. It's just the birth pangs. Birth pangs might last a while. My wife says they lasted a real long time. Didn't seem that long to me. But, but they last a while. And what we know about them is this, right? That the closer we get to the end, they're going to grow more and more intense, and they're going to come closer and closer together. But, but we don't know. Don't worry about when the end's coming. Do what you're supposed to do until Jesus comes. Number three, Jesus is real clear about this. All Christians are going to be persecuted, but you keep on preaching my gospel. Verse nine, then, and this doesn't have a time sequence to it. It's like, look, look this is what's going to happen. This is what's next. You're going to hear all this stuff. There's going to be all these things happen. And, and along with that, They'll deliver you to tribulation. Now, some people jump and say, oh, that's the great tribulation. That is a word, philipsis, it just means a crushing. And it doesn't, this doesn't describe a specific point or time in history, certainly not here. There might be one of those, but this, isn't talking, this is just talking about testing and trying and when, when the world starts crushing you, right? And they will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations. Why? Because of my name. This is what he told the disciples. There's only 12 of them there. This is what he's telling them. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 says, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Friends, that's just part of the deal. You sign up to follow Jesus. Somewhere along the way, people in this world are going to start treating you the way they treated him. And, and that's part of the deal. 
Now, I don't know when Jesus said this stuff in verse 9, I don't know if he was thinking about us. He may have just been thinking about the 12, or maybe, maybe he was thinking about all of us. I don't know. Here's what I do know. All the men that were there that day, save Judas, died a horrible martyr's death. Every one of them did. Every one of them were killed for preaching the gospel, but they kept on preaching to the very end. Verse 10 says, at that time, that's a reference to the tribulation. When, when you're being crushed by the world, when the crushing comes, Many will fall away, and they will betray one another, and they will hate one another. Persecution has a way of separating the wheat from the trap, right? It shows who's real. Everybody's real when it's easy. It gets hard. It has a way of separating. And some people turn on from Christ, and some people turn on his people. And we should expect that. Judas did that. Verse 11, many false prophets will arise, and they will mislead many. Because lawlessness is increased, this a disregard and a disrespect for the law of God is part of the birth pangs. It's just going to keep going up and up. And as that happens, most people's love will go cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Please don't misunderstand. This is not saying that you earn your salvation by enduring to the end. But when you endure to the end, it proves that your faith was real, that your salvation was real. The crushing and the endurance reveals that the conversion was true. Finally, the gospel of this kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. What end is that? Is it the destruction of the temple? Is it the return of Jesus? Or is it the end of the age? Hmm. That might be the most hotly debated verse in all the New Testament. Doug Lucas spoke here, uh, uh, what, about a year and a half ago. Doug is uh, the president of Team Expansion, who is our partner in in our uh, work with the Unreached People Group, which we call the Zephyr, where Dr. Bernie and, you know, Andrew are. And and it's, um, uh, he believes, and he preached from this pulpit. He, He said from this pulpit, he used this verse, and he said, he does not believe that Jesus will return until every, and he used the word ethnos, people group on the planet, has had a chance to hear the word and uh, the gospel. And the word ethnos is used in the Great Commission, but it's not actually used here. Uh, but he talked about what that was. And he might be right. He might be right. Maybe Jesus isn't going to come until every people group at least has a chance to get the Bible in their language. That's what he believes, right? And he preached it. And he might be right. But um, a lot of other biblical scholars would point out to you that the word that's actually used here, that we translate, in my Bible it says the whole world. Some of your Bibles it might say the inhabited world. I don't, I don't know. It's translated different ways. This is not the word cosmos. It's not the word ethnos. It, this is... This is a, a word that was commonly used in the first century to describe the inhabited Roman world, the world of the Mediterranean basin. And it was often used to describe that world, not far off places that, that no one had been, but where the Romans were and where they reigned. Okay, now just think about this. Jesus is talking about 33 AD. He says, and let's just say this is what he meant. I don't know, but it's, I think it's possible that Jesus, this, one of these three things that you guys asked me about is not going to happen until the whole inhabited Roman world has heard the gospel. He said that in 33 A.D. In 62 A.D., 29 years later, Paul wrote a letter to the church in Colossae in which he said that world has heard the gospel. The gospel has now been preached everywhere in that, that basin. It's an amazing thing. In 30 years, they had done it. So a lot of scholars think that Jesus is talking here uh, about, you know, the end of the world. He's not talking about the end of the world, but the destruction of Jerusalem. And the destruction of Jerusalem happened eight years after Paul wrote his letter. Now, premillennialists don't believe that that was the fulfillment of it. But even guys like R.C. Sproul, who doesn't believe that, what I just told you, he admits that from a certain perspective, and it's very plausible, it's possibly right, and here's his quote, everything Jesus says is going to happen before the end has already happened. 
If that's what Jesus meant, and that's the way they commonly use that word in the first century, it's happened. So even if you have this whole thing about an antichrist and ten confederation nation and all the Hallel Lindsay, hallelujah stuff that in the 70s kind of dominated, even if you believe all that stuff, everything Jesus said is going to happen has happened. He could come back any second. There's, there's no biblical reason he can't return. There's just no biblical reason for that. Do you know what I think Jesus was talking about here? I've studied this all week. You know what I think? How many of you would like to know what, what I think? This is my opinion, right? I have no idea. <laughs> I really don't. I understand it. I can argue. If I, I'm an anti-dogmatic. If you take a strong position, I will take the other side because you don't know and I don't know. It might be either. This is what I kind of believe. might be both. Maybe... He was talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and the whole world here, and that was the foreshadowing of the rest of the world hearing when Christ returns. I, maybe it's both. We just don't know. Here's what I know. We're going to be persecuted, and we're supposed to keep on preaching the gospel. That's what we know. Number four, sometimes evil will appear to triumph, but you trust God's plan. Verse 15, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, put that in quotes, that's an Old Testament phrase, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet. When you see him standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. He wants you to know, I'm referring back. I didn't make this up. I'm, Jesus sp- referred back to Daniel. Now, what's that about? Okay, here's the, here's the fast view, right? In 600 B.C., 600 years before Jesus is having this conversation, Daniel had predicted that someday there's going to be an invader come into Israel, invade Israel. He's going to walk into Jerusalem, and he's going to desecrate the temple. He's going to insult God and the holiness of God. He's going to to abuse it. And he also will abolish the daily sacrifices. Every day the Jews made daily sacrifices. He's going to put a stop to that. Now, the book of 1 Maccabees, which a lot of you haven't read, but there's a little series of book called the Apocrypha. The whole story of Hanukkah is in the Apocrypha. There's some other very interesting stuff in the Apocrypha. If you were raised in a Catholic tradition, the Apocrypha was in your Bible. Most Protestant Bibles doesn't have it in. I like reading it. It's interesting. I think it's got some probably very accurate Jewish history in it. Uh, but it, it's all about stuff that took place between the end of Malachi and the birth of Christ. It's 400 years period. And uh, the reason it was left out of the Christian Bible by, by the early Christians was because they just they didn't know that it was inspired. They couldn't, they couldn't connect it and prove that no one said this is inspired. Jesus didn't evidently affirm that it was inspired. So we just don't know. By the way, that, that book existed. Jesus would have read it. He would have known about it. He didn't say anything about it. But in 1 Maccabee, which by the way, since it was available to him and he didn't use it, makes me, and he's still talking about it, it makes me think this isn't accurate. But here, here's what some Jews believed. In the apocryphal book, he says the prophecy of Daniel, the abomination of desolation, was fulfilled in 168 B.C. When Antiochus Epiphanes, he was one of the guys that hit, when Alexander the Great's kingdom was broke up, the king of Syria was one of the four kings, he came and he was going to Hellenize Jerusalem. He's going to wipe out the Jews. And uh, he did all kinds of atrocities. He was going to make them be, he was going to make those Jews be Greek. And he was going to make them worship Greek gods. And he was going to get rid of the Hebrew language and the Hebrew customs and the Hebrew culture and make them Greek. Like the rest of the world. And uh, one of the things he did was he went into the Holy of Holies and erected a picture of Zeus. And said, you come here to worship, you worship Zeus in the temple. And then he did something that you can't even imagine the insult this was. He went and all sacrificed pigs, right? You know how the Jews feel about pork. He sacrificed pigs on the altar. And then he took the priest in and he made them eat the pigs and he stuffed the pig flesh down their throats. Then he slit their throats and mingled their blood with the pig blood. It, 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 just trying to desecrate the temple and he stopped the daily sacrifices and they were stopped for a few years, but then they resumed. Now, Maccabees says that was the fulfillment of the prophecy. It sure sounds like it, doesn't it? Maybe it was a foreshadowing. Remember, Jesus is speaking in 33 AD. 
For the next 34, 35 years, there were all kinds of conflicts between Rome and the Jews, and it began to get worse and worse because there was a group of people, every once in a while we'll talk about them, they're called the Zealots, and they were gaining power, and they actually, in the late uh, 60s, actually took over the Temple Mount, and they had killed a bunch of Romans, and Rome was done. Rome was done with them. And General Vespian brought a great Roman army to the Middle East, but before he could start his campaign, he was called back to Rome, and he actually became the emperor, Vespian. And he commissioned his son, General Titus, to take control, and here was his commission. I want you to make an example of these Jews so that the whole world will fear Roman power. Son, it's your first big job. Do it right. And he leaves. So Titus starts working through the land. There's some small skirmishes. Most everybody ran. And he heads toward Jerusalem, and he arrives there in January of 70 A.D. with a great Roman army. But you know what? He just camped around, didn't, didn't come in too close. He just camped around and, and didn't attack anybody, didn't attack the city. And uh, finally, six months later, he did, and I'm going to tell you what happened. There was a siege, and I'm going to tell you what happened in a minute. Josephus, as some of you have heard about, he was a Jewish historian that was commissioned by Rome to chronicle the story. And he traveled around with Titus. He's in Titus's camp. He's traveling with the Romans, writing the history of this. And he says when Jerusalem finally fell, that the Romans gathered up 97,000 Jews, and they carried them off into slavery. And Josephus says they killed 1.1 million Jews. This is, this is not nuclear weapons or grenades. This is swords, spears, 1.1 million. Now, a lot of people today think uh, he, he exaggerated. There was probably only 1.4, 1.5 million people in the whole, that whole part of the world, much less there in the city of Jerusalem. But there was another Roman historian that was also witness to it, and he said that there was just 600,000 killed at Jerusalem. Multiple reports, multiple reports. There's multiple reports that when they were carrying the dead out the city at the end, that 115,880 dead bodies were carried out through just one of the city gates. And they were carrying them out of all the gates in all four corners. And out of one gate, they took 100,000-some bodies out and burned them. Friends, I have no idea how many people actually died but it was two out of three or three out of four people in this whole part of the world. And I am telling you, it was a slaughter. It was a holocaust that has no proportional equal in all history. Hitler killed six million Jews, but there were over a much bigger, wider period. There were way more people in 1940 than there were in 70 AD. There's nothing like it. Nothing, it it's, an, it's, an, it's a mind-boggling thing. And you know what the Romans did then? They went in and stone by stone, they tore the temple down to its foundation. Where above the ground, not one stone was on top of another. That was a whole lot of work. But they left God's house insulted, desolate, destroyed, desecrated. Okay, now Jesus told the disciples this in 33 AD. And for the next 37 years, Christians were reminded of the words of Jesus. Verse 16, when you see this abomination and desolation, you see the thing Daniel prophesied. And they had this foreshadowing. They remember Antiochus Epiphanes. They had that in their mind. But evidently, Jesus thought that wasn't it, but it was foreshadowing. When you see this coming, then those who are in Judea, that's not just Jerusalem, that's the whole region around it, they are to flee to the mountains. Now, what history really tells us is as the Romans came, you know what Jews everywhere did? They did exactly what ancient people did everywhere when they were invaded. They didn't run away. They ran into the walled city because in the walled city in Jerusalem was, the, was a great walled city, they, and they were, had water in there, and they thought they could withstand a siege there, and they went there, and they traveled in there like crazy. I told you earlier that Titus didn't attack right away. He just kind of set up camp. And so they begin to think maybe he's just trying to intimidate us. He's not really going to attack. And it came early spring, and they had the Passover. And what did Jews do? They all want to go to Jerusalem for the Passover. And the Romans let them all pass through. They let them travel into Jerusalem, into the city. 
for the Passover celebration. And then Titus tightened the reins, and he shut the door. And anyone that tried to step out of the city was instantly struck down, was killed. And he began to lay siege. He let over a million people pack into a city that was made to hold 100,000 people. And he shut the door. If you tried to leave, you were butchered. The weeks passed. They had water, but they had no food. People began to starve to death. Think about this in an ancient city. By the way, there's reports of cannibalism were going on inside the city, which is an abomination to Jews. They had this place called the Dung Gate, right? You know what the Dung Gate was? It's where they take dung. What do you do? How do you get your stuff out of there, right? You had a million people inside the city, but you can't go out and burn it. They would take it to this place called Gehenna, where the imagery of hell comes from, and burn it. They couldn't take the dead out. They couldn't take the sewage out. And just bodies began to pile up in the streets. People were starving. They could not bury the dead. They could not burn the dead because of their convictions. Disease began to spread. There are some writers that said it was a welcome mercy when after six months the Romans finally knocked the gates down and began to kill, rape, and burn. Here's some interesting historical trivia. As the Romans marched toward Jerusalem, the Christians remembered the words of Jesus. And instead of running behind the walls where all the other Jews were going, the Jewish Christians fled to the city of Pella, which is in the Decapolis, and it's in modern Jordan it's where the city is. And to make that 100-mile flight, they had to go to the mountains. They fled to the Judean mountains and then the Moabite mountains. Now, I want you to, I, want you, I didn't put this on for you to write down, but you need to write this down. When the Christians saw the invaders coming, when they saw the crisis coming, when they saw the prophecy coming, they didn't follow the crowds. They obeyed the words of Christ. And according to Eusebius of Caesarea, who was a bishop about 100 years later, it was a miraculous thing, and very few of them were killed. And for some reason, the Romans, they went down and killed everybody at Masada, but they just decided not to chase them. And it was miraculous that very few Christians were killed when 1.1 million Jews were slaughtered. None of the Christian Jews were killed. There's a few because they didn't get there. But it's a miracle. Jesus said, you flee to the mountains. That's what they did. He also said to them, whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things that are in the house. What's he saying? Run. You run. Whoever's in the field, you don't go back to get your cloak. You see it coming, you run. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. Pray that your flight will not be in winter or on a Sabbath, for then there will be a great tribulation. There, there will be a great crushing such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, and nor will it ever. And unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, God's called people, those days will be, 33 AD, they will be cut short. And that's exactly what happened. Number five, false rumors will abound. Remember the Lord's words. Verse 23, then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christ and false prophets will arise, and they'll show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I told you in advance, so that if they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. Behold, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. When Jesus comes back, you are not going to miss it because everyone's going to see it. And it's going to happen like that. And there, you didn't miss it. Everyone's going to see it. It's going to be this huge flash in the sky. And you're going to hear it. And the world's going to know. And this last phrase, wherever the corpse is, there are the vultures. And that's the Greek word for eagles. They're going to gather. You got dead bodies and you got the, you got the eagles flying around. There were birds everywhere. 
uh, eating the rotting flesh of Jerusalem, but a lot of people think every Roman battalion had a standard, and on the top of that standard was a eagle. And they think that's what this is a reference to. Well, a lot of stuff, right? We're going to pick up next week. I'll give you a little preview. Number six, the Lord shall return. So be ready. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for our time to study it today. And I pray, Father, you would help us to understand the things that you have made clear. And, Lord, more importantly, to obey them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.